And there were three characteristics to this guy. The first was that Barnabas was a good man. Then we went and looked at the church at Antioch and said, what does a good apostolic prophetic based church look like? And so we covered that for like three, four weeks. I talked about what, an, what a good church looks like. The second thing about Barnabas was he was full of the Holy Spirit. And some of you will remember I did a thing not too long ago where I talked about rivers or streams of living water that flow from within us, going back to Jesus at the last and greatest day of the feast where he stood up and declared, all who are thirsty come to me and drink. And to say that we get full by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I want to close the message off. So as you can see, we're trying with these new micro. This is now my third set microphone we're trying today. So let's see. If it doesn't work, the team's all ready to give me a new set if this is bothering you. Okay. The third thing it says about Barnabas, and this is the freakiest of all of it. It says Barnabas was a man who was full of faith. Full of faith. And so I've titled a two-week mini-series called Abraham's Uncomfortable God. Abraham's Uncomfortable God. My little title could be, what are the characteristics of a person of faith? It's wonderful to celebrate the fact that Barnabas was a man of faith. My fear sometimes is, where does faith come from? How do you get faith? Faith pleases God. Faith attracts God. In fact, without faith, you can't even get to God. God has to give you faith. Many Christians know full well that there are things in the Bible they find uncomfortable, but they acknowledge to be true. This is especially true in the way God seems to deal with certain Bible characters. Aren't you grateful sometimes that when you read certain stories in the Bible, you're glad that God dealt with that guy that way and not you? Aren't you glad you would rather read the story than be the story? Perhaps some of us even have a small fear that God may actually be taking a personal interest in us for his own sake. Can you think of being poor Job, minding your own business, just trying to get on with life, and God says to the devil, have you seen my servant Job? I think one of my deep prayers is, Lord, what happens, never boast about me. Ever, please. Boast about Job. I don't know about you, but it would make my heart go cold to know that I'm getting God's special attention. Now, I find it scary because Abraham was a man of faith. Where did he get his faith? Barnabas was a man of faith. Where did he get his faith? And if faith pleases God, and I want to please God, I have to walk in faith. But I'm a little bit nervous to walk in faith because if you ask for faith, let me ask you this. Don't answer, but how's God going to give you faith? He's going to give you opportunities where you need faith. I mean, have any of you been dumb enough to ever pray for patience? God gave you a child. <laughs> or he gave you a spouse. Where suddenly you need to dig so deep to find this patience. How? By making you exercise it more often. Two weeks time we're doing baby dedications. I always chuckle at these little parents who their cute little time bombs. <laughs> so when, when looking, I must say, I'm so grateful my boys are 18, 16 and going 13, 28 next month. Because it's just so wonderful. They went to youth on Friday. They come home. They do this. They do that. They just go by themselves. I'm like, thank you, Lord Jesus. They actually do grow up. Don't you find the first five years are like 58? <laughs> hey? That sleep deprivation of new moms when they have their... I'm not trying to dissuade you. <laughs> just live in the real world. So when we want to look at being a man or a woman of faith, we've got to look at the first man who became the father of faith, Abraham. Abraham's focus throughout his life was on God, to God's power to fulfill his own promises. 
and not to look at the circumstances he was facing. It's kind of what made Abraham faith. He looked forward to God makes promises, then God keeps promises, and they often fly in the face of what I'm facing right now, but God can be trusted. Romans 4.16 calls Abraham the father of faith, the father of all those who believe in God. And please remember, Abraham didn't have the privilege of a church, a Bible, commentaries, teachers, Christian upbringing, podcasts, Bible school. Do you realize that Abraham had to learn to hear God? He had to learn from God. He had to submit to God. And he had to obey God with no frame of reference or cultural background for it. Just think what it took for Abraham to be the man of faith who has nothing of what we have today in terms of resources in how to know God. And yet he pleased God amazingly by the way he lived. I know history for some of you is boring. For me, history is the most amazing subject in the whole world. But for some of you, history is a bit boring. But can you handle a quick history lesson? Okay, even if not, here we go. Let's look at Abraham's world quickly. In theology, you get a term called Sitzim Leben, which is the life circumstance of the person you're looking at. To understand Abraham is to understand the world he comes out of. Abraham lived nearly 4,000 years ago in a semi-nomadic, middle Bronze Age culture, totally removed from ours today. He was a semi-nomadic shepherd to whom God came and revealed himself. God made promises and God entered into covenant concerning Abraham's offspring and the land they would inherit in the future. Abraham somehow believed in this God and it was counted by God to him as righteousness and this faith shaped his life. Ultimately, the promises made to Abraham find their fulfillment in Jesus the Messiah and all who trust in the true God who become Abraham's spiritual children. Abraham was called a Hebrew. In Genesis 14, he was called an Aramean. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, he was born in Ur of the Chaldeans and moved to Haran with his father Terah. At God's call, he moved to Canaan. And then he lived in various localities, Shechem, Hebron, Bethel, the Negev Desert, Egypt, Gerar. These are all names and places you might have heard of. Genesis records that at one point he led a band of armed men to rescue his nephew Lot from kings who had captured him. We find Abraham interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah, which was the wicked place where Lot had chosen to live. We find Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. We find him entertaining angels. When the time came and he didn't have an, an, an heir, he bore a son Ishmael by his wife's servant who became the father of all the Arab nations. His heir Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah in their old age by supernatural intervention by God. I don't want to go there, but can you imagine you're going to go be intimate with your wife at 100. And there's no Viagra. He's 100. You're 90 plus. Huh? And you both probably smell like goats. No, let's live in that world. There was no toothpaste and toothbrushes. Get with it, people. I doubted anyone shaved. It wasn't November. It was Mo Year. How do you... I mean, remember Lord of the Rings. How do you separate the woman dwarves from the men dwarves? The woman's beards are shorter. <laughs> His devotion to God was such that when God asked him to, he was willing to sacrifice his only son. He grew wealthy. He married again after Sarah's death. And at the age of 175 years old, he died. That is Abraham in a nutshell. We're going to look at more of his dealings next week because it's a really long introduction. So I thought I'd split it into two parts. 
Let's look at the religious world into which Abraham was born. Abraham's ancestors were idolaters. They were polytheists, which means they worshipped many gods. Joshua even says in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 2, Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river, that's the great Euphrates River, and worshipped other gods. Do you remember when Jacob married Rachel? She grew up in Terah's religion. She stole her father's household gods. Archaeology shows us that Ur, which is in Lower Mesopotamia, and Haran in Upper Mesopotamia were centers of moon worship. As a matter of fact, the name Terah, which was Abraham's father, Laban, his cousin, Sarah, his wife, and Milcah, the one uh, 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 maid, contained elements that reveal allegiance to the moon god. Moon worship was from Abraham's father right through everybody he knew. Worship involved temples like ziggurats with small temples on top. These temples were staffed by priests who offered sacrifices, made offerings, singers, musicians, male and female prostitutes with a fertility cult, and much later than Abraham. The Israelites were warned against worship of the moon, the sun, and the stars in Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 17. And do you know that all the way through to 2 Kings chapter 23, the idolatrous kings of Judah worshipped the moon and the sun and foreign gods. That spirit of idol worship never seemed to leave Israel. Yet, this man Abraham, a moon worshipper, with a moon-worshipping father and family, has some kind of an encounter with God. And the question, of course, is how would he know the real God? And Abraham's faith grew as God revealed himself to him. By the time we find Abraham in Genesis 12, he is a monotheist, a worshipper of only one God. And first little point I want to throw out to you right now is this. Your faith, as a Christian, can only grow as God reveals himself to you. You can go to Bible school, become a doctor of theology, read books and documents, and never draw one step closer to God unless he reveals himself to you. It's only as God renews your mind and your heart and as God makes you new that you're able to embrace him for who he is. I mean... The very people who held on to the law of God were the very people who killed Jesus because they could not see their Messiah in front of them, even though he fulfilled more than 350 of their prophecies about him. He fulfilled them in their day. He apparently, Abraham, used two words for God. El, which was, by the way, you know El Shaddai, El Elyon, you know those names? By the way, when you use El in front, it is a generic Canaanite term for the, dosmi, the cosmic deity. So just so you know, when you start and you start, no, no, I just worship El Elyon, just know that the first part is you're using a phrase for a common cosmic deity that may be out there. You're not so super spiritual because you throw a few Jewish proverbs out. Are you okay? Can I tell you, I don't want to call him Jesus, I call him Yeshua, does not make you a more Christian than the rest of us. Is that all right? Correctly interpreted, you are a pain right here. <laughs> Yahweh. So he joins two names, El and often Yahweh, which is sometimes translated Jehovah in certain Bibles. But it's substituted as Lord. Because remember, the Jewish tradition was you never use his name. It's too holy. The Tetragrammaton, the, the name Yahweh, which means breath, is too holy. To be used. So they, they, they substitute it with the word Adonai, meaning Lord. Hence you'll get El Elyon, God Most High. El Shaddai, Almighty God. El Olam, Everlasting God. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. So Abraham came up with these names of God. What did Abraham believe about God? Well, he believed God to be the Lord of the cosmos. He believed God to be the supreme judge of mankind. And on these things I'm throwing out to you. If you're a leader in this church, you are subscribed to a WhatsApp group which gets my full set of notes. 
I just want to throw out this morning, just so you know, I've done this for years now. All my proper notes that get given that I preach on a Sunday are available for anyone in this church who wants it. All you have to do is speak to DJ or to Mark, get added to a list, and we'll send them to you. All the scripture references are there. Okay. He believed God to be Lord of the cosmos, supreme judge of mankind. He believed God to be in control of nature. He believed God to be highly exalted, and he believed God to be eternal. A wonderful thing about Abraham that stands out immediately is that, amazingly, whenever God spoke to Abraham, he obeyed immediately. It's like this guy knew where his bread was buttered. He might not have been able to prove who God is because there were no texts. But if God spoke to him, he obeyed immediately. Abraham's relationship with God was personal rather than formal. They practiced different kinds of worship, him and his sons after him. Building altars, offering sacrifices, calling on the name of Yahweh, circumcision, prayer, making vows, tithing, planting trees, setting up monuments. These were all expressions of Abraham's faith. The, so I'm going to stop there. But the big question I want to ask is this. How did Abraham become a man of faith? I don't know about you, but this grabs me. Do you remember I said in the beginning that sometimes we read about the characters in the Bible and we're so grateful it's them and not us? Or am I the only one that feels that? When I read someone and I think, Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm born in Johannesburg in the 21st century and I'm not in the circle of that person of faith. Because they often got themselves into situations I wonder how I would cope. If you go back to our approach of the God of the Bible... Do you know we have to learn to know him like Abraham did? The difference is for you and I, there are no excuses because we have all those things that Abraham didn't have. And so what some people do when they read the Bible is they don't want to throw everything out, right? Because it's in the Bible. And the book of Revelation says that if you exclude parts of the prophecy, those things will happen to you. So we don't want to do that. So we've got to keep the Bible in place. But the problem is we don't like it. And we don't like some of its claims. So what certain people do is they do, they unwittingly create what I would term the Fauerbach God. Do any of you know who Fauerbach was? Okay, an atheist philosopher who did not believe in God. And he put forward the notion that some people, meaning you and I, create a God or a religion to cater for an afterlife to make this life more bearable. So in other words, there's no God, there's no religions, but some people make a God or make a religion kind of according to their likeness to make this life more bearable in view of a life to come. And so what we do is we begin unwittingly to shape God according to our own design. We almost shape a God who won't do or demand what we're not prepared to do ourselves. Haven't you heard some Christians say, God, well, God would never tell me to do that? Ever heard that? No, 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 that can't be God because God only wants us to prosper and have joy and peace our whole lives, for instance. And so many times we take the God of the Bible and we reduce him to what we want. I believe God wants me to be happy. No, he wants you to be saved and surrendered. A word came this morning in, in worship. You might be new to this church. You might have been here for a little while. And you tell us, whatever you're selling, I'm not buying. Number one, you can't buy it. And number two, it is the free offer of salvation for everyone who would believe. This God of the Bible never shapes himself to suit humanity. The contrary is true. He reveals himself to us in his glory. And you've got to be very careful that you haven't shaped a Fauerbach Christianity. You've begun to say that God will only do certain things where you are always the very happy and pleased beneficiary thereof. Some Christians seem to battle with the fact that God can make demands on us. That God can adjust things in our lives whether we agree or not. 
whether we feel we're ready or not, whether we feel we're able or not. Why don't we let God do it? Can I tell you why? I believe because we would lose our false and perceived sense of control of our own lives. I think sometimes we're scared of what God will do if we truly give our lives over to Him. Not just your faith. I believe in Jesus for eternal life. I'm talking about giving over the life you live in this world over to Him. Go to Barnabas. Barnabas was full of faith. Abraham was full of faith. Sure. I believe Abraham met a very different God. I want to read you a couple of texts quickly. Genesis 12, verse 1 to 5. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all his possessions that accumulated, the people that acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Cain and they arrived there. Just stop there. Can you imagine today being 75 years old and God tells you to leave everything you think you know to go to a place he will still show you? How willing would you be for that? And that is Abraham, the father of our faith. Acts chapter 7, verse 2. To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even a foot of ground. But God promised him that him and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. Your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They'll be enslaved, mistreated 400 years. I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said. And afterwards they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And Abraham became the father of Isaac circumcised him eight days after his birth. Isaac became the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of the 12 patriarchs. Then one more. I'll do the other ones next week. One more. Hebrews eleven six, And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So are you ready for a couple of points? I got six points. Obviously, I won't share all today. Six points on the characteristics of a person of faith. How do you face it when you have to serve an uncomfortable God? A God who's not here to make you happy. A God who's here who empowers you, gifts you, and equips you to fulfill His purposes. Then, when you die, He holds you to account for what He called you to do, not for what He called someone else to do. And do you know how many Christians there are who take the talent given them they bury their talent and they hope that the day of judgment is never going to come when the bible i don't want to freak you out but the bible is very clear that every single person who's a christian will be judged on our works here on earth what we did to please god everything that he'll ever call you to do he'll do with you he'll never leave you he'll never forsake you the call of abraham cuts across all the niceties and the comfort zones we try to protect ourselves with. Abraham allowed God to do certain things to him, six things, that made him a friend of God. Are you ready for number one? There came a time when God got Abraham's attention. Genesis 12.1, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country your people, your father's household, and go to the land I'll show you. Friends, when God gets your attention, like what happened with Abraham, it demands a response in action, not just assent. When God speaks something to you, it's not just, uh, okay, lip service. 
Like the, the servant who said, the son, who said to father, I will go and didn't go. When God speaks, it demands a response. There seems to always come a time when God's kairos time moments coincide with his chronos moments and you and I have a decision to make. God will always get your attention. He'll always bring an eternal time moment into your living moments and demand a response from you. God demanded the supreme place in Abraham's affections. God will not be shared with any created thing. He demands supreme place in you and in me. And he will not be shared by any created thing. You see from point one, when God gets Abraham's attention, God reveals a predetermined plan that's only slightly revealed. Have you ever noticed when God tells you something of your life, he gives you one tiny step and not the whole thing? Ever noticed? He gives you just enough to get moving. I have a feeling that if God had told me before I planted a church what it would mean to lead a church, I have a very funny feeling I would never have taken this job on. Never. I'd rather have been a lawyer. Would you have married the person you are married to right now? Had you known what you know? Would you women have birthed that little squib that became your child? Had you known? Anyway, the point I'm just making is God only ever tells you enough to get you going. Why? Because he wants you to look to him. On the day you got saved, you learned there's a time God gets your attention. When you got saved, things started to happen in you and you responded to Jesus. God got your attention and then you realized that wasn't the end of the story. That's only the beginning. From the time you're born again until the time you die, you will have moments in your life repeatedly where God gets your attention. And have you noticed that when you first start out with the Lord, you've got a whole lot of assumptions that gradually you need to unlearn so that you can relearn the ways of God? Don't you remember being saved a year or two years? You read your Bible. You're the Bible answer man. You know everything. And then suddenly the longer you grow with God, the more he gets bigger and bigger and his mysteries grow in your life. The Bible describes it through Ezekiel as going ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, where you gradually lose control of your walk with God. Do you notice when you get saved, I go to church, I go to Bible school, I give a little bit, I do a bit of this, do a bit of that. I'm still firmly in control. Then God asks you to do some things for him and suddenly it's not so easy wading in the will of God. Then you saved a few more years and God asked you to do stuff and now you're waist deep. Now it's not so quick to run around and do your own thing. Then suddenly you find you're out of control in your own relationship with God. That's what the Bible means by keeping in step with the Spirit. It's letting the wind of God, the breath of God move you and you suddenly begin to get to a place where you realize finally you are totally out of control in your own life. You have surrendered it to the God of the universe. And I want to remind you under point one, God will keep getting your attention right through your life because the righteous live by faith and faith pleases God. And so I got good news for you and bad news. From the day you give your life to Jesus, you lose control of your life. And it's purely an act of surrender where you say, okay, God, I need your dealings in my life from time to time as a man or a woman of faith. Let's try and throw one little more in. I was going to do three this morning. Let's do one more. Second, first characteristic of a person of faith, God will get your attention. Second characteristic of a person of faith, do you know that God's plan, the outworking of God's plan would and does involve blessing? Genesis 12, verse 2 to 3. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I want to make a couple of very obvious points around becoming a person of faith. That when God intervenes in your life, it's not all doom and gloom. 
It is true he wants to kill you, but he only wants to kill the parts in you that's not helpful. Are you okay? God does not involve himself in our lives to our detriment. He doesn't look for a whole lot of seemingly happy people, see them saved, and then make them unhappy for the rest of their lives. Is that okay? It's actually a joy to be saved. It's a joy to have your sins forgiven. It's a joy to be known by God. It's a joy to use your spiritual gifts to serve the purposes of God. It's a joy that the God of the universe is never going to judge you for your sin. It's a joy to know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. One of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. These are incredible attributes. Can I just throw out quickly, if you're a Christian this morning, you're supposed to be joyful. Look at half of you. Look at half of you. You want to be a man of many tears because Jesus was. He had to go to the cross in your stead, not you. I want to say this. The only things that get messed up in our lives are the things that would hinder the blessing of God. And do you know there are times that God moves things out of your life that you really wanted there because He knows later they're not going to be good for you. In Acts 3 verse 26, God blesses us by turning us from our wicked ways. Sometimes God changes things in our lives that we didn't even know were wicked. And I don't know about you, but I look back on my life today and I'm filled with an incredible gratitude for the things God did cut off that are not good for me today. At the time, they seemed like such a sacrifice. Today, they're so easy and I'm so grateful. When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he first instructed that God the Father be glorified through the church's actions. And he said, when you pray, pray for the kingdom to come. Pray for God's will to be done. He comes to bless you. In Romans 12, 1 to 3, we read that the renewing of the mind is precisely to learn what good, God's good, pleasing, and perfect will in. So that we can walk in it by faith. Do you know that God has determined to bless you? And to bless you His way. It's not for you and me to try and bless ourselves. Christmas time, a credit card, tinsel on the trees, specials at the shops, is mostly you blessing you. Is that alright? I urge you this year, say, Lord, how do you want to bless me. I want to tell you there's incredible power and wisdom in the Word of God. And when we immerse ourselves in His Word, when we immerse ourselves in His ability to do things for us, faith is released in our lives we aren't often aware of. And I challenge you, the more you read your Bible and the more you rely on God, God takes over. He fulfills His will for your life. He blesses other people through you in ways, I don't know about you, but I am most blessed when others are blessed through my life rather than me being blessed. When you look, I mean, haven't you found, I'm probably going to say this on Christmas morning, but haven't you found that Christmas has lost its thing? Or Mother Only Oak? My kids, they can't wait for the loot. They've got lists out. This is what I want. I remember being, when you're one years old, you're far more excited about pencil and the wrapping paper, hey? When you're two years old, it's the box. You can poke holes in it. From three, four, five, you enjoy the gifts. Then a time happens, isn't it? You reach where when you bless others with gifts and they are happy, you are rewarded. Far more than if it's just you, isn't it? It's that natural way God's showing us that He blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. There's no greater blessing than doing the will of God and pleasing Him. And I close this point with this. God says that when our lives are involved in turning people from wickedness to Him, in the book of Daniel, when our lives are involved 
in turning people from their wickedness to him, the Bible says, we shine like stars in heaven. You know what I think? I think when heaven looks at you, if your life is involved in leading others to Christ through our endeavors, I believe your life lights up like a star in heaven because the gaze of God is upon you. A star reflects light. And I believe in heaven today. You and I have the ability that when heaven looks down on us, that great cloud of witnesses, they see incredible shining lights among us because the gaze of God is on us because all we're interested in is seeing people turn from wickedness to righteousness. What are the characteristics of a person of faith? Number one, God gets your attention. And number two, God wants to bless you. Stand with me, please. Thank you so much for being a part of our meeting today. Um, can I just ask two things? The first is, if today the, the message has in any way been useful to you, would you mind just maybe liking it or putting uh, perhaps a statement down or a comment down that we can know how the ministry has helped you? Maybe a, a thumbs up, maybe you can subscribe to the channel, do whatever, just so we can know what impact this message may be having on you. And secondly, you may be someone who's saying, Greg, I hear you. And this, this, this hope that Jesus has for us can come into my heart and it can change me. But the reality is that I don't even know if I know Jesus. I want to say two things to you right away. The first is he's near you right now. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that he is the Lord and if you confess him with your mouth, you will be saved. Which means you just need to, where you are, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, even now. And just say, Lord, here I am. I recognize who you are. I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you as Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, the Son of the living God. And I want to follow you. I want to become a disciple of yours. I want to, I want to give my life to you, Lord. And you can pray that prayer right now between you and the Lord. Secondly, you can get hold of us. Um, you can see the telephone number. You can get hold of us and say, hey, I've given my life to the Lord. Can you help me from here on out? And we could either send you some material. We can uh, put you in touch with a really good church near you. If you live in our area, you can come to us. You can follow us on YouTube. But it is good to get connected into the family of God, to get connected into a local church, that your life changes being surrounded with the family of God. Please stay in touch. God bless you.